Uh, I'm Corey Miller. I'm a tattoo artist from Upland, California, and I've been tattooing a little over 35 years. Basically, the first interest is just seeing, you know, punk rock bands and friends. I didn't do the typical apprenticeship. I had a friend of mine, he had an older brother who had gotten out of prison. His name was Carl, and uh, he was just a bad, bad guy. He was, he was interesting, and he, he had a little homemade tattoo machine, and he tattooed. That was kind of my beginnings to seeing people getting tattooed and uh, being in a band. I remember I wanted to be in this band, and they had this little insignia, so I, I got a straight pin and a old rusty razor blade and uh, just hacked my first tattoo on myself. And that was the uh, initial beginning of it. Just a home hand poke tattoo and a razor. And next thing you know, a few of my friends had seen it and they wanted one. And seeing my uh, buddy Carl, this older brother tattoo, uh, just got me going and I made a homemade tattoo machine. I'd never seen one. I'd seen the rotary style uh, machines that they made in jail. I don't know, I figured something in there went up and down or spun round and round and I, I just figured it out back and forth at school, got an old guitar string and sharpened it up and put that machine together and had my first willing buddy and laid him down on the table at home and told him to don't move and we started tattooing. And that was the beginning. As time went on, there was a local guy here, Franco Olito. He was an old uh, Sicilian guy, East Coast tattooer. I wouldn't call him old school, I'd just call him kind of lowbrow. He was a real dirty shop, a little seedy place. He had the old steel sheet in the window. Never knew what that was for until years later. You know, I guess back in the day, it was uh, pretty normal to piss people off. And someone would throw a rock through your window or maybe a Molotov cocktail, like he used to say. You know, our culture of tattooing really hasn't seen that too much. It was interesting to hear about it. But Franco was an old time guy, and uh, he let me come around and hang out and tattoo, draw designs for him. And I was, like I said, I was doing that when I was 15. By the time I turned 16, I was in that shop every day. A lot of what I learned in that shop was a lot of lessons more of what not to do. As, as far as everything, I'd never seen a prostitute or seen what a lot of the bad drugs were. All that stuff was relevant. All of it, it was my first introduction to seeing outlaw bikers and uh, gangsters. and It was all scum. <laughs> it's funny, I tell the guys now, every once in a while when a dirt bag walks in, it's like, man, you know, back in the day, that was all we had. Every once in a while, somebody nice would walk in, you know, a soccer mom. You'd be so happy to see, you know. But anyways, as time went on, uh, Franco went on. It was a very competitive thing. I remember as I got better and hanging around in that shop, one of the first things that happened was uh, somebody came in and, I want Corey to tattoo me. His skulls look good. Your skulls look like sand crabs, Franco. And Oh God, next thing I knew, I heard when I wasn't around, oh, that kid's gonna take food off of my dinner table. And it was a very cutthroat mentality. It wasn't, we weren't here to help you. It was everybody for themselves. You know, a lot of people, if they were gonna help you, they would tell you the wrong thing to do. Franco inevitably lost his shop. That's what happens. Uh, there was a lot of great, fun stories back then. You know, it was like we were on Stromboli's Island. Me and my friends would go hang out there. It was just like for the Lost Boys, you know, Frank would buy us booze. He would drive us around, have us go vandalize places that were messing with his business. If someone was just fucking with his kid at school, he would literally, you know, take us out on missions to go vandalize their house. He was, he was, a, he was an interesting character. I left Franco's, started tattooing out of my home, which is interesting. These days I hear a lot of people say, oh, scratchers, and you know, it's a bad thing. And I've never really had that elitist view. I respect it, and I understand people coming into shops and apprenticing. I've had an apprentice, but there's no real one way to it. This was my version. It was more of the, I didn't go to jail, but I learned a lot from the guy from jail. And then I went and hung around a tattoo shop. And even in there, it's like, oh, you can't do that street stuff. That's jail tattooing. I'm thinking, well, I'm not in jail, so it's not jail tattooing, you know? And, so eventually for the next few years, I tattooed out of my home and uh, I did pretty good. I got a decent reputation. I had people coming to my house all the time. I was a carpenter, so I was coming after work and I would tattoo all night and we'd stay up all night, literally. Uh, 
until sewn up and tattoo, and then we go to work and then come back and do it all again. And that refers to those to the college partying years. In all reality, this is where it got good. I think I've been incredibly blessed in my tattoo career. Around 86, we knew of a guy's name like Mark Mahoney and uh, Jack Rudy we'd heard of in Tattoo Land. I think I was always attracted to that because of the style work I did, the black and gray work. I didn't know what it was gonna become. I just, it was just a style and it was one color, it was black ink and we'd get the little bottles of Pelican and we'd tattoo with that. But uh, Mark Mahoney and uh, Bob Roberts was one of the first tattoo parlors, real shops I ever went into. And we'd drive out to Hollywood with our buddies and we'd scrounge our change. And Bob would actually tattoo my friends even though we were 16 and 17. And we'd go out there and get tattooed by Bob. And that was like a real tattoo parlor to me. I was like seeing these hand painted designs and Bob's still one of my favorite guys. And favorite tattoo artist. I don't know, it's just, I think when you're young and you see that for the first time, it, it hits you with something. Even though I, I'm really, that wasn't my style, that I love traditional, but Bob was one of those guys that just really hit me and just said, wow, this, it really attracted something to me. So even though I went to Bob's, I'd never met Jack Rudy or anything, but Mark Mahoney was buddies with some of my friends and he would come out to uh, the Inland Empire out here where we live and we'd have parties, you know, we'd make sure there was plenty of shit around, plenty of, you know, party favors, a few guys that had money and Mark would come out and he would do these hand-drawn, beautiful tattoos. Mark was like the best, man. You'd see, he could do like pinup girls and choppers and hot rods. Anything Mark did was just bitching. He was just really, he's just a great tattoo artist, still is. I would go hang out with him and I'd, I'd bring my little pictures hey Mark what do you think of this hey Mark what do you think of that and you know looking back it's just how it was it wasn't like oh yeah little brother oh you're gonna be good it was like oh yeah you know you should you should probably stick to the construction you know you'll do good with that tattooing's a horrible business you know and did his best to keep me away it wasn't personal it's just uh, like I said it was the way you were, they were raised back then it was to keep everybody down in a sense so I would always tag along with Mark and uh, I'd enjoy watching him with these shows and every time he'd like maybe kind of shoot me down it just kind of built me up even more and said man you know, next time he comes he's gonna see even a better tattoo you know and I'm gonna keep doing better so I used to go out and I start hanging out at uh, Fat George's Fat George's was a tattoo shop in La Puente California and it was in the hood I mean it was right on Valley in Santa Mariana you know and I'm this little white punk rock kid from Inland Empire driving out to El Monte and it was sketchy, man. You know, it was just a whole different scene. And I'd go in there and regularly asking Fat George, total prick, it, nothing personal. He was just an asshole. And I'd go in there, hey, George, you know, uh, uh, Mark introduced me. Hey, this is Corey. He wants the tattoo. And I'd say, hey, George, I'm looking for a job. I ain't interested. I mean, just instant shut you down. And he wouldn't just shut you down. He'd insult you. He was just like, oh, God, this guy's an asshole. Why would you want to work here, you know? And, but I still did. I wanted to get in somehow. So I'd come again in a few weeks. Hey, George, you know, I was trying to get Mark to tattoo me. Mark would always put me off. I finally asked and asked, and lo and behold, very lucky for me, this is the beginning of my very lucky career. One day I was in there talking to him. George had shot me down, and, and I looked over to Mark. I go, well, how about you, Mark? Let me come work with you in Hollywood. Mark had been planning on opening his first Hollywood shop on 3rd third and Fairfax. It's gonna be the first Shamrock tattoo. And uh, I guess Mark hadn't told George. And that's how it was, man, you know. I inadvertently, I guess, dry ratted Mark and let George know that Mark was leaving. And George was like, what shop? You know, oh, Mark, oh, well, George, I was gonna tell you, you know, I got this little place, checkerboard floors, it's beautiful. And George didn't even let him finish. He's like, fuck it, you can start tomorrow. And that's how I got in. I got my first job and I was working at Tattoo Gallery in La Puente, California. As time went by, guys like Freddie Negretti would be stopping by to use the Lucigraph machine, this old tracing machine, or Mike Brown would come in there to use some tracing paper or some stencil paper. And these were guys we'd only heard of. And you know, they were in there coming down there because you know, they'd got fired from Tattoo Land or they were on the street tattooing. You know, it was always bad shit going on, you know? A lot of good people worked at George's. Like Kerry Barber had worked there, Mark Mahoney had worked there, Mike Brown had slipped through. And I didn't realize how lucky I was, but on the walls in there was old pipe flash, you know, Bob Shaw flash. Burt Grimm flash. I'm looking at these really simple old yellow shitty cigarette stain designs. You know, and you think to yourself, oh, these are all so simple, you know, but it was fun and we'd go in there, we'd do like sometimes 10 tattoos a day, sometimes 20 if they were getting names, because the Chicanos, man, they love to get names. And that's where I learned to do the real nice handwriting. It was an art, you know, and those were the few things Mark taught me years ago, the little wave to draw a nice little curved name. And as you jump forward 30 years that you cherish, 
you know, stuff that you can see on the internet, this and that. It was just so hard to learn anything from anybody. So there I was in this barrio shop, tattooing these old designs from 60s to 70s generation Pike Flash. Fat George's didn't even have a copy machine, man. You know, people say, oh, how'd you learn to freehand? It's like, because we didn't have a copier. We didn't have a stencil maker. Yeah, to learn to draw it. Back then, we, I actually was lucky enough to learn how to use the plastic stencils. And those were the old stencils you'd engrave and you'd stick on somebody's arm with powder. The second you touched it, it all washed away. So you needed to learn how to draw anyways to do a decent tattoo. I got in, I was there at Fat George's. It was awesome, man. It was one of the best things I ever got out of George's was uh, one day I was lucky enough to buy an old tattoo machine from him. It was an old Mike Brown machine, one of the few original Mike Brown machines ever made. And it's one of my favorite possessions to this day. I started meeting people, and this was a pivotal point. There was a guy named Dick Worsaki who worked for Jack Rudy at Tattoo Land in the early 90s, late 80s. And we'd all heard of Tattoo Land, and by now we knew Jack Rudy was, Jack Rudy was just bottom line the best. Then he starts telling me my machines suck, and I can't use them if I come work in his shop. And you know, grow a fucking beard. Grow some fucking hair, man. I can't have no clean-shaven motherfuckers working in my shop.